Hello and welcome to this St Andrew's Music Participation Concert coming from the Laidlaw Music Centre at the University of St Andrew's and it's in partnership with the Wallace Collection. My name is Ellen and we're about to go on an amazing journey exploring the seas and the oceans with some help of some great music composed for brass instruments and some very special young performers that I can't wait to introduce you to. So I hope you're sitting comfortably and ready for the ride. Now I'm going to need a bit of help with this today. I don't really know anything about the oceans, so I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Richard Bates, a geophysicist from the University School of Earth and Environmental Studies. Hi, Richard. Hi, Ellen. Yes, so I'm Richard and, and I work in earth and environmental uh, sciences at the university. And as Ellen says, I'm a geophysicist. Now, many of you probably don't know what a geophysicist is or what a geophysicist does, but I look at ways of measuring what goes on in the planet, in our planet, planet Earth, using remote sensing. So I look at the oceans and what lives in them today and also what's lived in them in the past. I try to understand changes in planet Earth. I try to understand changes from natural systems, from nature, like climate and what the climate was like in the past and what the climate could be like in the future. And if you turned up to the workshop last week, then you'll have heard me talking a little bit about the oceans and how they work today. And that's what we're going to explore further here with music and with a few uh, hints on the science from myself. So, shall we get to the first piece? That's a great idea. Thanks, Richard. So our first piece is called the Stamp Overture and it was composed by Fife-born trumpeter John Wallace from the Wallace Collection and it's actually dedicated to the University of St Andrews and the seven brass bands of Fife. The music is full of excitement for brass music and instruments just like our Stamp Brass project which aims to reinvigorate local brass bands and to nurture a generation of young fifers to take up brass instruments. This piece is based on a simple idea, seven bands, seven tunes, one after the other. And when he wrote this piece, John took ideas from the last 500 years of brass music. So it's full of fanfares and familiar brass licks. The first tune is Kingdom Brass, then it's Dunfermline Town, Loch Gelly, Geyser Colliery, Buckhaven and Methyl, and then Tayport before Tullis Russell round it all off. Yeah, and you know, we've chosen this piece to start the concert journey because it's based on where we live. You know, we live here in Fife and the natural and cultural heritage of Fife is dominated on three sides by water. So we've got the North Sea to the east, we've got the Firth of Forth to the south, and we've got the Tay Estuary to the north. And of course, throughout Fife, we've got many rivers that flow down to these waters. So in some way, we're all connected to the sea. And whatever we do on land, in our houses, in our towns, eventually it'll flow down to the sea and from there out to the oceans of the world because they're all connected together. All this is part of a great cycle known as the water cycle. So let's get on. Okay, now to accompany this piece, we've created some visuals of the 90 children participants of our Stamp Discovering Brass program. So you'll see some footage of them during their lessons and practice whilst you listen. And I'd like to say an extra special hello to all of them and their families this morning. It's been an absolute highlight of our pandemic lockdown getting to know you all. So here is the Stamp Overture composed by John Wallace, played by the Whitburn Band, conducted by Bede Williams.
wow, that was fantastic. And if you're listening from one of the five bands, we really hoped you managed to hear your band in that piece. Thanks to John Wallace for a great addition to the brass repertoire. Now we're here today to explore our oceans. And Richard, can I ask you to tell us why the oceans are really important for us on land? What role do they play in planetary regulation? Yeah, well, I said the oceans and the world are all joined together. And that there's this great cycle, the water cycle, that moves water from the oceans onto the land as rain, then washes back down through the streams and the rivers back to the ocean again. But, you know, the oceans also regulate the heat of the planet. Okay, They maintain a healthy planet. I mean, one in which we can live. And they move the heat around the planet in these giant currents, right? And the currents act like massive, huge conveyor belts. They don't only move the heat, but they keep the oceans healthy by moving food around for all the creatures, the fish, the whales, etc., that live in the seas. And they do one inc other incredibly important thing, and that's they help balance carbon dioxide. Now, you might have heard about this carbon dioxide and what it's doing in the atmosphere, but what it does in the atmosphere also affects what it does in the oceans. Carbon dioxide, of course, is this gas that you hear about that's causing the planet to heat up. And through our burning of fossil fuels, we're making this happen very, very fast. And very soon, the oceans may not be able to cope with all that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and cope with all the heat in terms of transferring it around. So, Richard, what will be the result of that then? Well, uh, you know, an unhealthy, too hot ocean with too much carbon dioxide, it could mean a change in climate because the oceans affect the climate. And of course, the climate affects weather. You know, weather and rising sea levels might be a result. Weather and more wildfires that we're seeing on land might be a result. And of course, at sea, weather means more and much bigger storms. Wow, I've really got a picture of the sea in my head now after all that, Richard. I'm imagining I'm actually sailing the oceans on a big ship. It's kind of an old fashioned ship with big sails and lots of rigging in it. But I think I can hear some music. It's a hornpipe. Now a hornpipe is a piece of lively music for dancing to, which is actually said to have begun on ships in the 16th century. And this is sort of why we associate the sound of a hornpipe with sailors. Um, why can I picture a pirate ship in my head? Why don't we listen to a hornpipe? So this one was composed by the Scottish composer Ian MacDonald and is part of a larger work for brass. So Maharities, what are we waiting for? Clear the decks, get your dancing shoes on. Here is the hornpipe from Sea Sketches by Ian MacDonald and performed by the Wallace Collection. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
to the Wallace Collection. Well, storms at sea can be totally awesome. Huge waves, immense power, and it's not the place to be in a small boat. And of course, as these storms approach the shore and the seas get shallower, well, watch out. Storms are hugely inspirational. They're hugely devastating. Ellen, have you got anything we can include in our concert today linked to storms, perhaps? Well, yes, Richard, luckily I do. I've got a piece composed by the 19th century French composer, Jean-Francois Bellon, who wrote a series of 12 pieces for brass quintet. Now a quintet just simply means a piece written for five instruments. And you'll see here the musicians playing instruments that were used at the time Bellon was alive. So they look a bit different to modern brass instruments. Can you spot any differences? Now, Richard, this piece was written in 1850. What would the sea, seas have been like during Bellon's lifetime? And, you know, how would they differ from today? Yes, well, well, back then, you know, there could have been, and in fact, we know there were some great, great storms. The, uh, our history books tell us of great storms in the past. And of course, you only have to look around the world and see, you know, the number of shipwrecks that are reported because the boats just could not survive those big, big seas. The big difference, of course, is our boats today can survive bigger seas, um, you know, but also the seas are changing in some ways. We are getting more storms these days, and often those more storms um, are bigger storms. So it is changing somewhat. It's not that we never had storms in the past, but they're getting more frequent today. Well, great. Thank you for that, Richard. So let's go back to the storm. Here is a musical depiction of the storm from quintet number no. seven for brass, recorded by the Wallace Collection on period instruments in the Laidlaw Music Centre late last year, especially for this recording. Now this recording was just an audio, so we've got some visuals to accompany it, created by the artist and filmmaker, Tim Fitzpatrick. Oh my goodness, it's all getting a bit too rough for me. I'm feeling a bit seasick. Richard, help me. How does the sea actually calm down after a storm? Well, of course, storms are all about energy and they get that energy from differences in the atmosphere between the high and the low pressure cells. And these form because of differences in temperature often. 
the more extreme the temperature gets, the bigger we could expect the storms to get. Eventually, of course, however, the pressures and temperatures even out. And of course, as that happens, the storm energy wanes and dips away. So a calmness will follow. This is like most things in nature, you know, there's a balance. There's a kind of natural rhythm or a cycle. You know, we've talked about cycles of the water. Well, there's cycles in many different things in nature. You, I'm glad there's gonna be some calmness to follow. I don't think I could cope with too many more rough seas. Let's go to another piece of music. Now we've got a really special piece for you next. It's a world premiere, which basically means it's never been heard before. Now, as I mentioned, we're working with around 100 young people from Fife and the surrounding area on our Stamp Discovering Brass project and teaching loads of young people how to play brass instruments and connecting them to local brass bands. Now, our young musicians have been composing music in their lessons with our tutor, Tony George, from the Wallace Collection, and also in their sessions with local band tutors, Denise Crichton Ward, Alison Milne, and Lucy Lamb, which we're going to hear in a moment. It's called Ebb and Flow. But Richard, what exactly is Ebb and Flow, and what do we mean by it? Well, you know, Ebb and Flow describes, again, a natural rhythm of the earth. Now, I'm sure you've been down to the beach and watched as the tide comes in and the tide goes out. The ebb and flow of the tide, and it happens because of the way the moon revolves around Earth, planet Earth, and a little bit about how we revolve around the sun. And the water, of course, on planet Earth is all connected and every ocean then is pulled by this motion. And the motion's vital, not just to, you know, our being able to go out and enjoy the coast, but it's vital to so many of the creatures, um, the animals living in the oceans. Great, thank you. So now we worked with composer Pippa Murphy and film artist Tim Fitzpatrick on this piece. They were really inspired by all of the music that our participants had created on Ebb and Flow, and they brought them all to to brought them all together to create one piece of music with an accompanying film. So I hope all our discovering brass students are out there watching this. This is Ebb and Flow. Thank you. 
Wow, that really was amazing. Well done, everyone. And I should perhaps point out that for a lot of those young people, they've only had about two lessons on their trumpets as they're quite new to the program and they're already composing on them. It's just, just brilliant. Now, things aren't always plain sailing at sea, are there, Richard? There have been some quite severe changes to the pulse of the planet in the last hundred years or so. So what's going on here? Yes, you know, unfortunately, over the last few hundred years, what we've been doing to the planet is having a really big impact on these natural rhythms. So we fired the Industrial Revolution, quite literally, by burning hydrocarbon. That's oil, coal, gas, things like that. And in doing this, of course, we put up into our atmosphere a lot of gases, and in particular, this carbon dioxide that started the excessive heating of the planet. More heat, more storms, more things like rising sea levels through the melting of the polar ice caps. More carbon dioxide means more turning the oceans acidic, and that's not good for the creatures that live there. So the natural cycles that we want to maintain are being disrupted. And what's not good for nature, of course, is also not good for us ultimately. But you know, all is not lost, not quite yet. But we must act fast. We must stop heating our planet. We must start using green energy. We must stop polluting the atmosphere with, and therefore polluting our oceans. We've got to think before we ruin the very planet on which we live. We've only got one planet. We live here. And we must do these things before it's too late. Well, it's good to hear that there are things we can do, Richard. Um, and I'm pleased to hear that there is some good ideas coming forward. Now, I actually think I've got a great piece of music that sort of depicts what things that Richard has just been talking about. And it's also based on our nautical theme. The title, Full Fathom Five, of this piece actually comes from the play The Tempest, which was written by Shakespeare and is over 400 years old. Now, the story of the play starts with a shipwreck. And a fathom has a nautical connection. So, Richard, do you want to tell us what that is? Yeah, well, a fathom actually was just a, a measure. Um, and in fact, one fathom equals six feet. So that's about 1.8 meters. So it's just a way of measuring depth. And sailors used this all the time. They used to go to sea. And in fact, they would uh, measure the depths of the sea beneath the boats with a um, what's called a, 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 a sounder device. And, and really all that was was a piece of string with a big weight on the end of it. And they'd throw that over the side of their boat and they'd measure how many fathoms it was. And then the person at the front of the ship would call out to the captain, you know, three fathoms, four fathoms. And you'd never want to get down to one fathom because then you'd probably be hitting in the bottom. And that's where the shipwrecks come in. What a great system, fantastic. So. The piece we're going to hear is called Full Fathom Five for Brass Quintet by the English composer Steve Martland. Now the style of this piece is minimalist, which means it sort of uses a minimal amount of musical material and it's sort of built on the repetition of notes and chords that sort of change slowly over time. All the parts are layered together and interlock, but also have a sort of strong rhythmical pulse underneath, I suppose, possibly a bit like our ocean. So here, once again, are the fantastic players of the Wallace Collection with the first movement of Steve, Steve Martland's Full Fathom Five. Thank you. 
Wow, I just love that piece. Thank you so much to the Wallace Collection. And I think playing that piece together in a room is hard enough, let alone when you're doing it in separate spaces. Now, we've talked about what's happening to the Earth, Richard, and the Earth has never had such a force of nature as humans. So how can we help to make the future better? Well, we can do many things. You know, we can use less energy. You know, switch those lights off when you're not in that room. Um, we, we can also, you know, demand that our energy is moved to green energy, you know. We can also think about what we buy and use, um, you know, things that are less disposable. Think about reusing and recycling. You know, many of these things you've heard about, but we've got to put them into practice. We've got to use ways of sustainably living on this planet. Now, it's, it's kind of interesting to me. I, I said at the beginning, I do archaeology. You know, I look at people in the past and, and how they have lived. And we look at ancient people and they used to live much more uh, tightly with nature, working with the natural rhythms of the planet. You know, they did that. Uh, some of the solutions they had are called nature-based solutions. It's kind of like how they used to look at and use musical instruments in the past. They used natural things around them. They used sticks, they used stones, they used shells to create their music. And often the music they made was very much in rhythm with nature. It had nature's elements coming through the music. We see that in cultures all around the world. And it's the base of all of our music today. So we need to listen to the planet. We need to listen to planet Earth and help it recover. So that it's a better place for us to live in today. And of course, it ensures a better place for the future. Thanks. Now, I think talking about ancient humans and instruments is actually a great introduction to the final piece in today's concert. Now, Richard mentioned that natural materials were used for the first instruments in ancient times. And the Wallace Collection have actually put together a special improvisation on natural and ancient instrument types for us today. And it seems like a great place to end this concert. So thank you to everyone involved in the making of this film. And it takes a lot of people to put this together, especially thanks to Richard and to our Discovering Brass participants. You totally inspire us to keep on doing what we're doing. And I hope today has inspired you to keep on playing your instrument and to take an interest in the oceans 
and the natural world and all the things that we can do to help it, like Richard mentioned. So here is the Wallace collection with an improvisation on ebb and flow. Hey, hasn't this been an amazing concert? So many different things. So we're going to finish it off with a piece about ebb and flow. Now, talking of about ebb and flow, we'd all love to thank the ebb and flow masters, Ellen and Richard. Yay! Amazing job. Now, ebb and flow is all about the oceans. And we've actually playing some instruments for you to now, which are found in the oceans. Have a look at these. Now, John and Bede and John and myself are all playing these things called conch shells. But Bede and John are playing something called Triton's trumpet. And that's an amazing instrument. They, they, you're going to love the sound that these make. So our final piece for you is about ebb and flow. And one of the things that you find in water a lot is driftwood. And thousands of years ago, people took wood, hollowed them out, and made them into instruments called didgeridoos. And we're going to be playing these for you as well. So this is going to be an atmospheric, exciting piece. Why don't you think about what the first thing we play makes you think of. Are you ready for ebb and flow? Because we are. <laughs>
Oh, <laughs> my